Good afternoon, and apologies for not having been here earlier, courtesy of flight schedules, I managed to still make it on time. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you about a larger issue, education emergencies, and more specifically about uh, what it takes to bring virtual learning into spaces that perhaps uh, you have not been to yet, and perhaps you may never set foot in. Uh, on the whole, however, I believe that the online learning revolution holds a great deal of promise uh, for those who will never ever enter a building that we call a school or a university. Uh, those who are, however, still keen to learn and still motivated to learn. What I'd like to cover this afternoon are a couple of things, and I know I've landed in an architecture session. So I have pitched part of my talk to actually building and building problems, because it's quite um, fascinating to see what makes learning possible in emergency contexts. You would think that certain things are obviously the same as the ones that we encounter in a university setting, uh, but other things you may never have thought of. Most of my talk is actually around visuals. I don't usually put a lot of writing on there. There are a few slides where there is so much writing that you're not going to be able to read it, and I'll just walk you through a number of points. But the rest of it, I think, uh, is just for you to get a feel for what must it be like to be in a conflict zone and wanting to learn uh, at a level that is higher than primary or secondary education. And I'm more specifically taking you into higher education in emergencies, which is a field that is very sparsely populated. I think I can count the actors on the fingers of one hand, and I still have two left over. Uh, there aren't many of us uh, who are diving into this field, partly also because international law does not prescribe higher education for refugees and in conflict zones. There is, in international law, a requirement to offer primary education. It is the host country that needs to offer it. There is a requirement for secondary education. That's where we have a lot of dropouts already, uh, but there is nothing for higher education. So the talk will kind of blend uh, our year, well, four or five year experience now in bringing learning into conflict zones with a new uh, dimension now, and that is how can we and how can learners in conflict zones truly make use of the many open resources that are available online? How can they access massive open online learning? What are the barriers? What are the obstacles? Uh, and how can we overcome them? So that's a little bit the framework. And uh, I will make sure that I leave plenty of time for questions in the end. Now, in the introduction, you have heard that I am kind of a very strange breed. <laughs> On the one hand, yes, I'm still an active conference interpreter at the UN organizations in Geneva. Uh, on the other hand, I actually come from cognitive psychology, so I'm a, a funny blend. Uh, my research field is cognitive neuroscience now. Uh, the other research <coughs> part is really in education and emergencies, and that's where also the action is. Uh, but we've also developed our own learning environment, so we know from our own hands-on experience what works and what doesn't work, and what we can tweak uh, without having to go to some of the major providers to ask them to tweak it for us. So we do the tweaking ourselves and try and test and experiment uh, with what, what works. To give you a taste of where you end up when you want to do higher education in emergencies, I'll focus in particular on the Horn of Africa. It's one of the areas I know best and it's one of the areas I, am, I go to very frequently. Um, there's also Afghanistan and other areas that I've gone to. Uh, but not as regularly as I'm down there. Our in-zone project now has an office at the UN in Nairobi, so I kind of share my time uh, between Kenya uh, and, and Switzerland. And these are some of the pictures. All of these pictures are 
taken by myself. These are some of the images that uh, represent what is the daily reality. You can look at classrooms that are chock full uh, with learners. Uh, you see learning spaces that, yes, do not resemble anything that you might ever uh, encounter. And then you have what happens the moment you step out of that learning space. You have other living spaces, and some of them don't deserve the name living space at all. There is the reality of armed conflict. There is the reality of not being able to move. And the issues around protection are crucial in higher education and emergencies. They're particularly crucial for women. Uh, if you can't get women to a place where they can learn in safety, uh, you're not going to get education to women in those places. You're going to have to be very creative uh, and very attentive uh, to who your female learners are and how you're going to be able to support them. And I'll share with you some of the ways in which we have gone out uh, to support especially female <coughs> learners in those contexts. Some more learning spaces uh, for you to get a feel for where we are and what you see when you walk around, you, if you can walk around. In some places you cannot walk around, especially not in the Dabra Fiji camp. You can no longer walk around. You can't even go in what they call a soft skin vehicle. It has to be armored and it has to be an armored convoy and there are very strict schedules and if you're not out at 7.45 in the morning, you're not going anywhere all day. Uh, and if you're not back by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're not coming back. Uh, so it's, it is very tight, it's very structured, it's very, very complex. And that too, uh, with any time, anywhere learning, it's just a phrase that doesn't mean very much in a conflict uh, zone. When you go there, and I must confess in the beginning, I did not have a humanitarian organization behind me that debriefed me when I came back. Uh, and yes, it took me a while to get my feet back on the ground in Geneva and you know, to walk around and, and just be a bit uh, dazzled and uh, impressed with how easy everything was. Uh, <coughs> but I think one of the things that has been most motivating has been to see the dire reality uh, and to encourage uh, myself, continue to encourage myself, but also my staff, uh, to really find solutions that would work and to find them on the ground. I have to go here. I do see it here. Um, last uh, summer, I actually uh, met with Daphne Collar, and I'm sorry I didn't see her. We were uh, exchanging emails this morning, and I know that she wasn't going to be here this afternoon. Um, I talked to Daphne Collar, and uh, I, I kind of uh, challenged her, and I said, uh, are you really sure that MOOCs are democratizing education? Uh, you know, can we go out and prove this? Or can I, can I take you up on this? Uh, and uh, she said, yes, please do. And so I did. Uh, and uh, all along, I think Coursera has been very, very supportive of the case study that I launched uh, last fall uh, in the RAB. Um, they're about, uh, well, in the world at large, there are about altogether 50 million displaced persons, including, well, that includes refugees internally displaced uh, and, and those who are seeking asylum uh, in third countries. UNHCR, the organization that uh, by international law is entrusted with uh, taking care of refugees, uh, is the organization also that has now launched an education strategy that includes higher education. And their goal is really to get a 100% increase in the number of refugees that would be able to benefit from higher education. And then you look at the map and you look at where uh, MOOCs are being accessed and you can clearly see there are big voids. And those big voids obviously coincide with the kinds of conflict zones uh, that we go to. Uh, there is not really a great deal of uh, uh, access in uh, the Horn of Africa, for example, and different African countries as well. So when you go out and you launch a research project in those contexts, uh, you are very definitely not just uh, following the rules of your uh, institutional review board, 
uh, but you're going to have to place your research into the broader context of the humanitarian principles because you're operating in the humanitarian space. Uh, that has various consequences for the kind of research you do and how you're going to go about it. Uh, one of the principles uh, that you see um, up on the left, the do no or do less harm, uh, is indeed the guiding principle when you engage in research. And for me, that meant if I'm going to launch a research project uh, with MOOCs in these emergency settings, my first and foremost objective has to be to get all the refugees to the finish line. Everything else was secondary. I would not be allowed uh, to do more harm, holding out some sort of award uh, and having them imagine that they might get there and then not making sure that they would ultimately get there. So that meant that I had to learn side by side with them uh, and uh, anticipate uh, a lot of the things that would come up and that would potentially pose problems uh, for them. So that was the relocation. There were only, it was a case study approach because Again, with the do no harm principle, you don't want to engage a big group only to find out it's not going to work in the end. So I think I thought at least I was going to be able to take care of two if everything were to collapse, uh, but not of a larger group. Um, some of the languages that uh, these two had, the level of education, both of them already had two years of higher education. Uh, and the MOOC, uh, the one that uh, I chose, not the one that was recommended by Coursera, but the one that I chose, uh, ultimately uh, was a uh, course offered by the Commonwealth Education Trust uh, on the foundations of teaching and learning. Something that's very relevant for refugees because primary and secondary education in the camps is obviously a, a major attraction for those who have some level of higher education in, in, in the camps for them to get a job. Uh, just very quickly, the course characteristics, it was on the Coursera platform, there were about 16 video lectures in this introductory course, um, there were four quizzes and two essays to write and six peer assessments uh, to, to do. So what were the challenges? Obviously technological, and I think that's the one thing that you would immediately guess, well, the connectivity, ICT, uh, where do they learn? <laughs> But uh, it wasn't just technological, uh, cultural, the intellectual culture, the learning cultures, but then also linguistic, uh, the mastery of written English. Most of the MOOCs still, despite the fact that there's a lot of activity now also to bring French and Spanish and Arabic uh, MOOCs online, linguistic challenges are very real. The method was the case study, and I was on site for the setup in November because I was launching another course for 50 other learners uh, that is humanitarian interpreters, so I was already there, ended up, and I could get them started uh, in a face-to-face -face setting uh, before we went online. So the three broad areas, uh, challenges and solutions, the accessibility and protection, uh, the connectivity and the learning and cognition, what I call the geography of thought. And it's an area that I'd already researched before because in our own learning environment, we've run an advanced master's degree uh, in teacher training for interpreter trainers uh, for the last 10 years. So I've been quite familiar with bringing learners from different intellectual cultures together in the virtual space and to see what the friction and what the tensions uh, will be uh, in what we... Uh, what our learning environment has as its foundation, a socio-constructivist uh, base. So in collaborative learning, seeing what happens in those spaces really uh, reminds me always of the geography of thought. This is the one that I don't expect you to be able to read, but um, the various stars uh, indicate the kinds of challenges that I encountered along the way. And the procedure was, I would anticipate a challenge, hopefully anticipate the challenge, because I was always a step ahead of them. Uh, anticipate it, try and find a solution if it was really something I knew they wouldn't be able to solve themselves. Uh, find a temporary solution, negotiate with Coursera, uh, and then with one of, my, uh, one of the education officers of UNHCR quickly transport that solution to the DAB so that the refugees would not have to stumble uh, over it or 
find, um, you know, not find a solution. So these were the ones, and they were fairly equally divided into technical, technological challenges, uh, access challenges, things like signature track uh, for every assignment that gets uploaded. Um, you would think, well, why did they want signature track? Well, a refugee who's going to invest hours in learning wants to have a certificate in the end. I'm sorry. It is the very stark reality of learning in conflict zones. They want to have a piece of paper in hand in the end. So it was worth going through the whole process of signature track and the webcam and finding somebody who had a webcam and allowing them to upload uh, their materials on a regular basis. Uh, the other challenge, however, uh, was also the unfamiliarity with a particular type of learning, uh, the kind of uh, open exchanges, uh, the rapid exchanges on forums, the whole idea of having forums that you would browse. There is no browsing on forums if each minute of online costs you about half your monthly salary you're not going to go and browse. Uh, and with the, chaotic, with the chaotic setup of the forums, at least on that course, on Coursera, there was just no way the refugees would ever access any forum. I had one forum post, and it was sheer luck that they ultimately found a place where they could post. And we were very proud that they could post, but it, it, was, it was obvious that that was a part of uh, the MOOC environment that was not suited at all, at least not in its unstructured uh, format. Um, some of the you know, last, um, last bits uh, and, and constraints, uh, financial constraints, I, managed, I, I, uh, I indicated already how much it costs to be online, but there's also time management, and I mentioned to you just how very structured a day in a camp is, uh, that the learning after hours that for us is something that we take for granted that people work during the day and then, yeah, when the day is done, yeah, they go and they learn. Well, you know, you don't do that in a camp because when the day is done, uh, the day is done uh, and you're not going to get online anymore because you're no longer anywhere near a place where you can go online. Uh, so those hours are, unless you can have everything already downloaded and available, you're not going to be able uh, to use. So how did we... Uh, how did we, after the case study was done, how did we go about finding some long-term sustainable solutions? And I'm not saying we found them all. We're still in the thick of it. And every day brings new revelations as to you know, what else we could do to make it easier. But I'll broadly divide them up into the accessibility and protection. Accessibility means you've got to have a space to learn and not the kind of learning space that I showed you up front. There's got to be a place where you can have peace of mind, where you can devote your attention to something that does require your attention. So one of the things that we did was we got together with a Kenyan developer and we developed a solar-powered mobile computer lab. Uh, this is the first model that actually was sitting behind uh, our office at the United Nations in Nairobi. Uh, and you see here the opening. It is an entirely self-contained module uh, it's a shipping container solution, a standard shipping container, uh, entirely solar powered, uh, with a computer that is purpose built for Africa, has no moving parts, and thus will not take in any dust or anything, is very heat resistant, uh, and operates as a host to 10 clients. So that is the maximum that the solar system, the solar uh, energy system is supporting. And that particular solution, uh, we actually, uh, well, we actually installed, and I'll show you how the installation looks like a little later. The shipping container solution, however, has a big drawback uh, in that it gets incredibly hot in there. And you operate in environments where the temperatures are 40 plus every day. Uh, no, it's no fun, and I can tell you, you don't want to be in there. Uh, I've suffered through uh, a couple of weeks of it, and no, uh, that, that is not, not very, very much fun, and you can't really think anymore after half an hour. So then we went back and we said, okay, what other sustainable solutions can we find? And the, it was really absolutely uh, essential that everything be sourced locally. 
that it would be sourced locally, that it would be recyclable, sustainable. So we did not really want to sh bring anything in from anywhere else. It has to come uh, and be locally sourced. So we then developed uh, a very comparable solution, a slightly larger mobile computer lab, but um, built, and here you see it's still in the, in the space, and here it's already in Dadaab on the border of Somalia uh, as it's being set up. You can also see that on, on the ground, I'll show you the next one, on, on the ground, it's not sitting right on the ground simply because it needs to have air to circulate uh, for passive cooling. So we wanted to maximize the passive cooling in there so we could actually sit there and learn for several hours a day because to bring the refugees into the learning space, at least for some courses, we're paying their transport. And they're there all day. Uh, and if they're going to have to be there all day, it's got to be acceptable. The walls also were constructed in such a way that they provided that kind of passive cooling, and the <coughs> solar system is, is on top. So here you can just see some pictures of how these things go up, and uh, here's the inside, and uh, yes, no, we're not operating with a Windows system. We obviously went open source, and uh, everything uh, goes on Linux and Ubuntu. Uh, that was a new one for me to learn. I had not been <laughs> familiar with it before, so I had to do a quick study on, on Ubuntu. But it certainly, it was a good lesson that I learned when I left my learners in November, about 50 of them with USB keys with all the learning materials, and I came back uh, a couple of months later, and all of them were so massively <coughs> virus infected that I had to wipe them clean all 50 of them, and recharge them with the learning materials. So that was a good lesson to learn. Don't go Windows. You need to have uh, an environment that is more or less virus-free because the places they go to, they'll always pick up those viruses. And this kind of shows already our, um, our own learning environment as it's booted up in this particular container. Another thing that we need to understand is that in emergency situ situations, everything goes mobile. Everyone, every refugee has at least one mobile phone, if not two. But what we also need to know is that if it's a female learner, it's quite often the husband who has the mobile phone and won't let go of it. So you need to be very smart and outsmart the kind of cultural constraints that come into this learning space. But you can see there's rapt attention as they you know, test out this particular uh, solution. Uh, and uh, since then, we had a 250% increase in the number of assignments that have come in ever since the lab opened in mid-May. So it really shows, and we had a 100% uptake by women. And we have a 100% uptake by women because I sent money from my mobile phone via M-Pesa directly into the refugee camp to pay the transport and a meal for the woman to be protected while she is trying to get to the learning lab uh, and can then learn all day long. So I think these are you know, some of the solutions that we need to think of uh, as we go along. This was before, this is at the other camp on the border of South Sudan, um, where we launched an emergency uh, response after South Sudan went back into crisis mode and about 18,000 refugees crossed the border into Kenya again, and we did not have enough interpreters for Dinka and Noor, so I went up there and we launched an emergency course. It was the fifth time I'd been to Kakuma refugee camp. At that temperature and in that first shipping container solution that I showed you, there was no way we were going to learn. So in we brought an extra solution. The challenge was, do we have an AC system? Is there any cooling system that won't consume more than 80 watts? That was all that the solar system in the learning hub was capable of sustaining beyond the computer system. So this is what we found, and it's just been installed two weeks ago. Uh, it is actually a water-cooled kind of uh, system. Speaking of water, water is an essential ingredient in learning. And you may think, well, where's the connection? Well, the connection is very simple. Kids who need to go and fetch water, women who need to go and fetch water are not going to go and learn because that's what they do. And that's what they need to do pretty much all day. So you need to understand uh, the uh, relationship between water and learning. Where is the water available? How long does it take them to go and fetch it? How can I get them out of this particular mode 
Uh, how can I move them away uh, from fetching water and getting them into a, a learning situation? We installed the second uh, lab up in Kakuma, right in the middle here, in Kakuma 2. Uh, and it is fairly close to a water well. So that was another consideration that we had in trying to choose a location. It had to be in the middle of the camp, that was essential, but it also had to be close to water and availability of water so we wouldn't have people moving away. And here it is, the one that you saw up front at the UN is now up on the border of South Sudan. Uh, again, elevated from the ground, so we've got some, some passive cooling and this is where we, where we had uh, the cooler built in. Coming to the challenge of the intellectual space and the intellectual traditions, and so what does it take for people up there uh, and in those kinds of situations to learn to acquire skills? The emphasis for us, at least in our experience, has always been on skill acquisition and much less on just knowledge acquisition because interpreting is a skill uh, that re re relies heavily on knowledge, but you've got to be able to do it. You've got to be able to perform it. Uh, and a lot in the humanitarian space is actually about skills of being able to do things. Those are where the needs are, uh, whether it's learning how to build something, whether it's learning uh, to become a health practitioner. There, there are skills. It's not just knowledge. So for us, you know, coming from that particular vantage point of allowing people to learn skills and acquire skills, we also know that the training courses where you go in and then you leave after a week are for naught. It is waste, wasted money and a waste of time. And I think it is incredibly frustrating for those who are on the ground. Because when you leave, everything closes down. So the virtual, I think, has this other dimension and this other holds out you know, the hope of keeping the learning spaces open uh, as you know, we are allowing the learners to stay in touch with us. And they do. They use the learning environment as you know, a combination of WhatsApp and you know, chat room and, and what have you. They're so used to these short messages and they'll send you short messages and they feel really that they are indeed still uh, part of this learning environment that you've just uh, put together. The language and culture issues should not be underestimated. Uh, even in one and the same camp, uh, in the DAP in particular, where you have half a million Somalis, uh, you have an incredible number of clans. And the clans are, you know, continue to be at war with each other, just like they were in Somalia. There's not much difference. So they've been spread out in different camps. But when you're doing online learning, you need to bring them back together again. So a lot of our effort has also gone into making sure that those clan uh, fights, you know, do not continue in the learning environment, that that is a safe space where you can say what you want to say and what you need to say. Some of the assignments that you get back obviously have a very different look to them. Uh, you, I mean, these are, you're probably not familiar with because this comes from the field of interpreting. It's taking notes of, uh, of speeches, uh, or of dialogues, uh, and it's a particular system that uh, we acquire. And here you have uh, two very different, uh, one from Sudan, actually, when I was in, in Kassala on the border of Eritrea, uh, an, an Arabic interpreter actually who, this was a three minute speech that I gave and that was all that she needed to bring it back in Arabic afterwards. So it was, it was quite impressive. So different ways in which assignments are being <coughs> accomplished. Cultural constraints also have a lot to do with the place of women in these societies. And I've mentioned this a lot of times, but I particularly liked that. Uh, it's not a poster, but uh, you know, not even an advertisement, but a reminder, yes, that to all the refugees in the camp, that yes, real men educate their women, uh, and it's. I, I saw it a couple of times. Uh, it was almost like you know, it, it resembled very much all the health reminders, you know, get vaccinated or you know, do not do this or do that. Uh, but it, it was a very, very good reminder of the dire situation of women uh, and and learning. Yes, there are cyber cafes in the camps. You wouldn't believe it. Um, but uh, they have a very different look to them. Uh, and they offer very, very limited opportunities 
And for women to go into those spaces, you can imagine what might happen in the end. Uh, those are not good places for female learners to go to. So building environments uh, for them is essential. The other thing is, and one of the reasons why I didn't choose the course that Coursera was recommending that I choose, uh, but the one that I ended up choosing was learning has to be contextualized. It has to be meaningful for those on the ground. If it's not meaningful, they lose interest. There is, there's a complete disconnect uh, at some point. So what we're doing, because we're just you know, halfway through building a MOOC that is respectful of emergency situations and really will allow uh, learners in those situations to access it, we're actually going into the camps and we're filming the learning materials there, using refugees as videographers uh, and making it as real and as contextualized as we possibly can. So that, that's another way of bringing learning in there. <coughs> Lastly, you have to respect a number of uh, recommendations uh, that are partly, the humanitarian principles are binding. It's international law. These are recommendations that have been issued. Uh, there's the International Network for Education and Emergencies with a clear emphasis on primary and secondary education. Very little on higher education just yet, but they're getting into it. Uh, there's also UNESCO. There, there are other recommendations that uh, you need to, uh, to follow. I think, lastly, one can conclude that, uh, yes, conflicts usually arise because communication fails. And I think one of the very interesting research projects in the humanitarian space that I've come across, that I came across about a year and a half ago, was called Listening, the Listening Project. And it was an organization uh, that went around the world for five years listening to people at the receiving end of development aid. And it made very instructive reading. Because we always think we know what's good. Uh, we always think we have the solutions. And unless you go and you really listen and you find out and you work on solutions from the ground up, I don't think you will ever really know. So I think that is a reminder. And that's just a thank you to those two refugees who participated. And yes, they gave their consent. Uh, to be photographed and uh, for the picture uh, to, uh, to be shown. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>